Hello and welcome to the Europeans podcast. We spend our weeks reading about what's going on in Europe so you don't have to, apart from in this one weekly dose of chatter that we put into your heads every Thursday. That's a very pithy summary of what we do. Thank you. I'm worried I may be overpromised, though, in saying that we're like going to summarize everything that's happened in Europe. I also didn't spend my entire week reading about what was happening in Europe, full disclosure. I did spend a good chunk of it reading about Europe, though. What did you spend the rest of the week doing? Uh, well, to be honest, I spent quite a lot of it reeling over the news from Russia last yeah. week about Alexei Navalny, as you did too, I imagine. Yeah, incredibly sad and depressing news. Seems like Putin is just more and more emboldened to do whatever he wants to ensure that his power is untouched. Yeah, and it's it's really one of those stories that seems to have sent shockwaves across the whole of Europe and the world, really. And because it's such a huge story, it is one of those stories that we do feel has been covered really very well by the rest of the media. So we're going to be focusing on some other stories this week. What are we going to be talking about, Dominic? Well, we'll first have Good Week, Bad Week coming up for you, as always. But then we're going to be heading to the country, actually, that has the closest ties to Putin's regime within the EU, that is Hungary. Because it's been a pretty politically tumultuous time in Hungary for the autocratic Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Two of the most prominent female politicians from his party, Fidesz, were forced to resign due to a pardoning scandal around a child sex abuse case. It's being described as Orban's biggest crisis yet. But how serious is it for him? This week, we're going to be joined by one of our favourite Hungarian people, Victoria Scherdult, amazing journalist from one of the few remaining independent outlets in Hungary, Have a Gay. But first, it's time for... Who has had a good week? I'm giving good week to Greece after their parliament voted to legalise same-sex marriage. Yay! Greece became the first orthodox Christian country and the 16th country in the European Union to legalise same-sex marriage. Just 11 EU countries to go now. Catch up, guys. Chop, chop. It was a policy from the centre-right Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis. But in the end, the bill actually only passed through Greece's parliament due to support from politicians from outside of his party. Mm -hmm. Something that was necessary because Mitsotakis got a lot of pushback from MPs within his own party, New Democracy, and even from some of his ministers. 51 of the party's 158 MPs either voted against the bill or abstained from voting alongside all the far-right MPs in the Greek parliament. But the bill still passed with a majority thanks to this rare show of cross-party support from the main left-wing opposition parties. So it's the first orthodox country to legalise gay marriage and a country where the church has still got quite a strong presence, I think, in some parts of society. Mm -hmm. Like, what did they have to say about this? Well, as you can expect, they weren't too pleased about it. Uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which is based in Istanbul and heads up all Orthodox churches, they came out against this bill and Greece's senior bishops actively campaigned against it as well, asserting that marriage is the union of a man and a woman and that is the source of life. <sighs> Greek bishops actually threatened to excommunicate lawmakers who supported the bill. Wow. But it passed anyway, so there... And why did Mr. Takis decide to push for this law knowing that so many of his own MPs were going to have a problem with it? Maybe because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> sassy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. That is rather sassy. And maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but hey, who knows? That could be part of his thinking. And he is from the liberal wing of his own party. So it's a policy that lines up broadly with his political ideology. You may remember that Mitsotakis won a landslide, a re-election victory last summer. Mm -hmm. So perhaps he also chose this moment far from another election to pass the bill, even if it's not entirely popular with all of his party's political base. And he made some pretty good points while making the case for this bill, arguing that marriage is nothing but the culmination of the love of two people. He said, we are talking about something that is already in effect in 36 countries and on five continents, and nowhere does it appear to have damaged social cohesion. 
But of course, this is politics. So there could be other reasons why he decided to pass this bill now. Some analysts think it was a politically savvy decision because it presents Mitsotakis on the world stage as a modernist, as socially liberal, at a time when his political reputation is in danger, both nationally and internationally. Earlier this month, the European Parliament passed a resolution expressing concern about very serious threats to European Union values in Greece. They hone in on three main concerns, media freedom, Mm -hmm. the use of spyware against political opponents and police violence and mistreatment against migrants. Really very serious allegations that threaten the rule of law in Greece. So perhaps he hoped that by passing this bill, it would take the focus away from those allegations and make him seem more like an acceptable politician on the world stage again. Mm. But who knows? Uh, One thing that I found interesting about this bill was that it wasn't only some of his MPs that were against the bill, but also recent opinion polls suggested that a narrow majority of the Greek public oppose same-sex marriage. Oh, wow. A majority are opposed to it. Yeah. Something that I found a bit depressing. But you could also argue that the opinion of the general Greek public shouldn't be relevant. Like, public opinion should not be the leading thing in a case like this. You don't need a majority of the public to agree with granting equal rights for a minority group of people, I would argue. Also, it's one of those moments where you just think, what are these polls going to say in five years' time? I bet you'll see a huge change. Yeah, I hope so. And does it just legalise same-sex marriage, this bill? Or is there also stuff in there about, you know, like uh, gay couples adopting kids and stuff like that? The bill also allows same-sex couples to adopt. Um, However, it excludes same-sex couples from surrogacy, which is something that Mm. activists were hoping for. And it also only offers limited access to assisted reproduction procedures. This is allowed for women, single or married, who are unable to reproduce for medical reasons. So it's certainly by no means a perfect bill, In the eyes of the LGBTQ plus community, there is especially big disappointment that the bill doesn't include provisions for trans and gender nonconforming people that were hoped to be included. But it's definitely progress. So good week goes to Greece. Enjoy it. Good week, Greece. Who's had a bad week? Yeah, I would argue that European defence companies are probably feeling quite rattled this week. And that is because of a ruling by the Dutch Appeals Court ordering the Dutch government to block all exports of components for F-35 fighter jets to Israel. Uh, The case was brought by three NGOs against the Dutch government, and the court agreed with their argument that there is a serious risk of these plane components being used to make fighter jets that are in turn being used by the Israeli government to commit serious violations of international law. I live here in the Netherlands, but I realise I don't actually have any idea of how big a player the Netherlands is in the defence industry and like the manufacturing of parts of planes. How big a player is it? Uh, Not huge, actually. So the European defence industry is really dominated by a few very large companies that make weapons and military equipment. So you've got BAE in the UK, Thales in France, Fin Mechanica in Italy. Uh, There's also, of course, Airbus, which is a pan-European company and a really big player in the defence market. But they're one of many companies in the sector that don't just make weapons. They also make like commercial planes. Uh, But in general, no, the Netherlands is not a huge player in this market. The reason that this ruling took place in the first place is because the Netherlands is home to a warehouse in Woensdrecht, which is in the south of the Netherlands. And from that warehouse, parts that get used to make F-35 fighter jets get sent to a bunch of different countries that use these fighter jets. Those countries include several in Europe, but also, it turns out, Israel. And what kind of planes are these F-35s? Yeah, so just in case you don't know much about fighter jets, and why would you, the F-35 is a very sophisticated plane. It's made by the US defense company Lockheed Martin, and it's considered to be the most sophisticated fighter jet in the world. It has a really powerful engine, super advanced radar, and it has all of these fancy stealth features which make it hard to detect as it's coming in. And it was no surprise when Israel became the first government outside the US to receive these fighter jets back in 2016. The two are obviously very close allies. 
And right now, the F-35 is one of a few different models of US-made fighter jet that are being used by Israel in its ongoing bombardment of Gaza. Now, this podcast is probably not the best place for a full-scale debate on whether or not Israel has committed war crimes in response to the horrific attacks by Hamas on October the 7th. So I'll just stick to telling you what was argued in this Dutch court case. Uh, The three human rights groups that launched this case, they argued that these F-35 fighter jets could be used in serious violations of international humanitarian law. And the court agreed with them. I'll just read you a bit of the judgment. It said... Israel does not take sufficient account of the consequences of its attacks for the civilian population. Israel's attacks on Gaza have resulted in a disproportionate number of civilian casualties, including thousands of children. The Netherlands is party to several international regulations which stipulate that if a clear risk of serious violations of international humanitarian law exists, the Netherlands has the obligation to prevent the export of military equipment. This means that the export of F-35 parts from Netherlands to Israel has to be stopped. That's a pretty clear ruling. Yeah. But the Dutch government are not so happy about it, are they? They're not, no. So they have already appealed this case. They've argued that a court shouldn't be making foreign policy. That's their job. Which is an interesting debate that we've had on this podcast before. You know, should courts be able to change government policy. Yeah, I actually read an interesting tweet thread on Twitter from a Dutch judge pushing back against that idea that the judge is sidelining democracy, because actually the opposite is true. The Dutch parliament has decided to bind the Netherlands to humanitarian law by signing onto treaties. So if a government then doesn't follow those treaties, it's the court's role to make sure that the government does. Yeah, courts exist for a reason. But yeah, this is a major headache for the Dutch government. They've previously been very proud to play a key logistical role in the F-35 program and hosting this warehouse. The F-35 program, of course, is this elite club of US allies that have access to these super sophisticated fighter jets. I should add that even though it still wants to be able to transport these plane parts to Israel, the Dutch government added in its statement that it continues to call for an immediate, temporary humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza and that clearly Israel must abide by international law. So yes, this is a headache for the Dutch government. It's also a major headache for Lockheed Martin, the American company that makes these planes. Unless this ruling gets overturned by the Supreme Court... Lockheed Martin is going to have to make major changes to its supply chains and find another way of getting them to Israel, if indeed it wants to continue doing that. Could this Dutch court case open the door to other similar court cases across Europe against defence companies? Yeah, well, that's certainly what Oxfam, the the Dutch wing of Oxfam, have suggested about the case. Uh, They were one of the three NGOs that brought this case against the Dutch government, along with PAX and the Rights Forum. And Oxfam said in response to the ruling, we hope that this verdict can encourage other countries to follow suit. And you would think that NGOs sitting in other European countries, even if they have slightly different legal systems, they might look at this case and think, you know, maybe this strategy could work here. There have been lots of protests outside arms factories in various European countries over the issue of supplying Israel. But this legal strategy has just been shown to be pretty effective in this one case, at least. And that is why I'm giving bad week to the European defence industry as a whole. Because even though this case is in theory just about a warehouse in Wunstrecht, I think it could end up being significantly bigger than that. And the longer that this awful war drags on, we're now at more than 28,000 Palestinians killed since Israel began bombarding Gaza. The more opinions seem to be shifting, even among governments that have previously been pretty friendly with Israel. It was interesting to see the EU foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, urging Israel's allies, especially the United States, to stop selling weapons to Israel if they're as concerned as they say they are about how many people are being killed. Let's be logical. How many times have you heard the most prominent leaders and foreign ministers around the world saying too many people are being killed? President Biden said this is too much on the top. It's not proportional. Well, if you believe that too many people are being killed, maybe you should provide less arms. But of course, even if that statement was aimed primarily at Joe Biden... As this Dutch case shows, the US is far from the only government supplying Israel with weapons and military equipment that are being directly used for the bombardment of Gaza. There was quite an interesting piece in Euronews back in November about the European countries that are supplying Israel. 
And it found that Italy and Germany were key suppliers along with the UK. I'll post that article in the show notes. But yeah, I mean, even if this Dutch case ends up getting overturned by the Supreme Court, we could well see other NGOs and other countries launching similar lawsuits. I don't think we've seen the end of the story. We only still make this podcast because A, people seem to want to listen to it, and B, because some of those listeners are so kind and decide to part way with a little bit of their hard-earned cash each month to keep this podcast podcasting. Do we not also make it because we like doing it? Oh, yeah. That's C, okay? C, because we like doing it. Thank you for clarifying. And we don't hate each other yet. Not yet. Six years, still going strong. Are you thinking about whether or not you could also help us out? If so, head to patreon.com forward slash Europeans podcast and you can donate from as little as two euros a month and receive various modest but charming benefits depending on the amount you donate. We think they're charming anyway. This week, a big thank you goes to our later supporters, Mary Bell, Sonatin Graf, Jay, Timothy, Andre, Tamar, Justina, Charlie, and to Isaac for increasing his donations. Thank you all so much. If you can't afford to support us right now, you could also help us out by telling a friend or two about this show or posting about us on social media. That also really helps us. Those social media platforms, what you can do that on, include Mastodon now. I launched a Mastodon this week, Dominic. Ooh, is it fun there? It's quite nice so far, yeah. I'm liking it. I feel like we're being very slutty with our social media <laughs> accounts at the moment. No shame in that. Slut positivity. <laughs> Let's go to Hungary, where the last couple of weeks have been punctuated by anti-government protests, including a huge protest in Budapest over the weekend. Tens of thousands of people packed into Hero Square. I feel like this is one of those stories that is really interesting, but probably only made it to like the Europe sub page of most international news websites. Yeah. But that is why we exist as a podcast. It's to shove those stories up the agenda. Um, Why have lots of Hungarians been taking to the streets over the past couple of weeks? Our guest is going to do a much better job of explaining that. But in brief, it turns out that Hungary's president pardoned a man who had been convicted of helping to cover up a child abuse scandal. The man in question was the deputy director of a state-run children's home. His boss had preyed on the children who lived there. It's a really horrific case. And then his deputy, the man who was pardoned, he had pressured victims of the sexual abuse to retract their stories. This man was sentenced to jail time for his role in covering up the abuse, three years in jail. But then he was pardoned, somewhat mysteriously, by Hungary's then-president, Katalin Novak, in April last year. And it's only recently come to light the fact that this pardoned man had had a role in trying to cover up the sexual abuse of children. And it sparked this huge scandal in Hungary and the most serious anti-government protests in years. Novak has now had to resign as president, along with former justice minister Judith Varga. So we have a lot of questions, as do many Hungarians. Why on earth was this man pardoned in the first place? And what happens now? Orban is the longest serving leader in the EU. He's been prime minister this time around since 2010. Is this a serious threat to the rule of one of the most authoritarian leaders in Europe? With us to discuss these questions and more is returning guest Victoria Scherdult, a reporter at one of the few independent outlets left in Orban's Hungary, Harvege. We gave her a ring in Budapest. Hi, Victoria. Hi, guys. Hey. Nice to see you again. Nice to have you back. Always happy to have our favorite Hungary explainer back on the show. Well, we have a lot of things to explain from the last two weeks, that's for sure. Yeah. Definitely. So much has been going on. Um, Last time you were on the show, we were talking about Viktor Orban's success in transforming so much of the media landscape in Hungary so that it's full of journalists who support him and his political agenda. So my first question is this. Are Hungarians actually hearing about this scandal in the Orban-friendly media? And if so, how is the story being presented to them? Well, the interesting thing is that this is a scandal so big that it's even portrayed in the pro-government media. Mm. It didn't happen in the first few days after the pardon scandal broke out. So that was just the usual stuff, only independent media covering it. But the scandal grew so big 
and pardoning the accomplice of a pedophile was such a big issue that it even reached those people who basically support Fidesz. So that's when the pro-government media started covering it. And we had uh, articles and sources telling us Fidesz had inside polls asking their own supporters what they think of the scandal, whether they think uh, Judith Varga or Katalin Novak should resign. And after the results of the polls came in, that's when the government media started covering it. So yes, this is a scandal that basically reached every corner of society. But it was interesting because they already started framing it. And the big message of government media was that it was a mistake to pardon the accomplice of a pedophile. But at least Judith Varga and President Novak, they took responsibility for their actions and they resigned. And this is something that we should thank them for, even if they did a mistake. Because, I mean, it seems like a very strange move for a government to go out of its way or for a president to go out of their way to pardon the deputy director of an orphanage who had been involved in covering up child abuse. How much do we know about why this man was pardoned? Basically nothing, because Mm. in Hungary the law says that the president doesn't have to give an explanation for the pardon, so we know nothing about the case itself. But interestingly enough, a few days after the scandal broke out, there was an article in the pro-government outlet Magyar Nemzet of uh, an anonymous source, so there was not even a journalist that it was assigned to, and it was a story of the person involved. Uh, protecting him, saying that he's such a good person, that he was behaving very well in prison, that he was already under house arrest when the pardon was given. His um, sick mother lives in Transylvania. So that was a strange article. And Mm. basically that's the only source that we have of the person himself. Okay, so there's a lot that's still unknown. But what we do know is that these two very prominent women from Orban's party have resigned, um, two of the pretty few prominent women in Hungarian politics. Do we know how much of the blame for the pardon actually lies with these two women or whether to some extent they seem to have been obliged to take the blame? Basically, not a few of the most prominent women. They were the only prominent women in Fidesz. We now have a government that's composed entirely of men and we don't have a president. So that's the two most important women being gone. And also they were very, very important figures for Fidesz because uh, Viktor Orban wanted to put them in charge of the European elections. Well, basically, they were the ones responsible for the pardon technically. President Novak was the one who gave the pardon and Judith Varga was the one as justice minister to countersign it. So, of course, they were the ones who had to take the blame. But there's another very important figure who is uh, not widely talked about, and his name is Zoltán Balog, and he's the bishop of the Reformed Hungarian Church. He used to be minister for human capacities a few years ago, and he still has very good connections with the government. And there were some very good investigative articles saying that he was basically the one who persuaded Novak to give the pardon. So actually, a week after the whole story broke out, he had to resign as bishop from the church. The interesting thing is that Viktor Orban was asked whether he knew about the pardon before it was given, and uh, he didn't communicate at all. One of his ministers said that Viktor Orban actually knew of the scandal from the papers. And uh, this time, I actually believe him because... uh, The president's office is sort of independent from the prime minister's office and there could be a chance that he only knew about it after it was given. There's also another character that's got a quite intriguing role in this whole thing, a previous close ally of Orban, this guy Peter Mariar. And he's now speaking out very vocally against Orban. He's this influential person with close connections to Fidesz. He also happens to be the ex-husband of Judith Varga, the former justice minister who's had to resign over this. And it's really interesting because he's not just been criticizing the government over the child abuse scandal. He seems to be trying to encourage much wider anger at Fidesz over things that have changed under Orban, not least how a small circle of people have become very, very rich under Orban. What game do you think he's playing here? 
That's the million dollar question we're trying to solve here at HVG as well. And I think all the newspapers are trying to uncover his motives, but we haven't found them yet. You said it very well that he used to be the husband of Justice Minister Yudit Varga, so he does know a lot. And for years, he used to be a diplomat in Brussels. And then afterwards, he was in the board of uh, state companies, so he knows the system from inside. He did promise a lot of insider scoops from the government, but he basically failed to deliver them. He hasn't uncovered any big scandal. He has only hinted at scandals on his Facebook page. So at this moment, we think he's just looking for attention. He gave a long interview to one of the TV channels last Sunday, and that interview has been viewed more than two million times which is quite big in a country of 10 million. Mm. So if he wants to uncover a scandal or just give out a message, he already has a big number of followers. So I think he's just building himself up for something that's coming. But we have no idea what's coming. Intriguing. I think many uh, government members are really pissed off at Magyar and his action because he used to be an insider. It's not customary in Fidesz and in the circus of Viktor Orban to like go public with the insider knowledge and what you know about the party itself. Yeah, and along that same path, I was wondering, would you say this is the worst crisis Orban has faced in all his years in power? Can you remember any moment when he's come closer to losing control of the narrative? I would say it's one of the biggest. Basically, I counted the scandals, the biggest scandals he had in the last 10 years or 12 years, and I found five of them. And it's interesting to see how he managed to stay in power after all of them. We had the big scandal of European parliamentary member Josef Sayer in Brussels, who was caught escaping through a drain pipe after attending an orgy in oh, Brussels. Yeah. So that was, During lockdown, right? Yes, <laughs> during lockdown. So that was a big scandal. And then we had the president, Paul Schmidt, who also had to resign because it turned out that he plagiarized his PhD. Whoa. Then we had uh, Zsolt Borkai, the mayor of Győr. It's a small town in Hungary, and he had to resign from the mayor's office because he was uh, caught on video having sex with prostitutes on a yacht. Mm. Yeah. So that's again, see, we have so many sex abuse scandals in Hungary nowadays. Returning to your original question, this is not the first big scandal that rocked Fidesz. But I think this will have long-term effects. This one is different because it involves kids, right? And and I mean, it. the thing that makes it feel different, I guess, is that Orban claims his political raison d'etre is to protect the family. And so because of that, it feels bigger than all of those scandals. Do you think his moves to contain the fallout from this have been enough? The reason I said that it's going to have long-term effects is exactly because what you mentioned, that protecting children is the core message of Fidesz and the whole government, not only protecting children, protecting families. And this went totally against the core message that they're trying to give out to supporters and the whole country and even the international stage. So I think this is the biggest credibility scandal of Fidesz, that whatever they do, however they might contain it, because at this moment... It seems that the scandal is sort of over for now. But I think, how can you look into the eyes of your voters and say that you are protecting children, knowing that basically the president pardoned somebody who was involved in a sex abuse scandal of minors in a children's home? And are we seeing any effect in the polls? Well, not yet. Uh, I think the biggest test will be the European Parliament elections. And then also with the municipal elections that we're going to have on the same day as the European parliamentary elections. I think Fidesz has lost some of his supporters, but it's really still a question whether the opposition can take advantage of this scandal. And the polls show that it's going to be basically the smaller anti-establishment parties that are going to win new supporters, including the two-tailed dog party who are uh, basically a satirical anti-establishment party. And then the other one is uh, our homeland, Mi Hazank in Hungarian, which is an extreme right party. And they're going to be the ones who might get into the European Parliament as fresh phrases. And if Fidesz performed poorly in the municipal and EU elections, 
Do you think that would be a sign that they're in serious trouble? I don't think so. My opinion as a journalist is that the only chance of the downfall of Fidesz, it's going to come from within. It's not going to happen in an election. And that's why this Peter Magyar story is so important. And the other thing is I talked to some pollsters saying that the problem is that the opposition is so fragmented that three or four of them will not get the necessary votes to get MEP seats. And then that means that Fidesz, even though they have 40% supporters instead of 45 or 50 that they used to have like back five years ago, they're going to have the same number of seats. I just have one question left for you, and it's an extra depressing one, so sorry for that. But the scandal was revealed by an independent outlet, 444. Some people suggested that the government is going to react to the scandal by cracking down even further on what is left of the independent Hungarian media. How worried about that are you? I'm not worried at all. Actually, they can't crack down any more than they do already. Honestly, We've been having a hard time under the Orban government for so long that I think uncovering one scandal is not going to make a difference. I found it really interesting what she said about the fact that so many of the scandals from Fidesz circles have had a sexual element to them. And I'm certainly no psychologist, so I really don't know. But I do wonder if this isn't a coincidence, if there is actually a link between a political ideology that encourages repression of your sexuality and sexually transgressive behaviour. If anyone knows of any studies or specialists who talk about this well, uh, then please do get in touch. But yeah, it's pretty sad that it seems that these scandals don't seem to make much of a dent in Fidesz's support. Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I'm really intrigued to see whether the scandal now has any impact on how Fidesz perform in the European elections, especially because they were going to be led by Judith Varga, this former justice minister, who was actually quite a a visible politician. I feel like even internationally, we heard from her quite a lot, having these uh, fiery exchanges with Brussels in the past. So that's going to be very interesting to watch in June. And actually, Victoria has an article about Hungary and the elections, so you will find a link to that right there on the screen. Time to roll into the inspiration station to have a little chat about some cultural goodies from this continent. What have you been enjoying this week, Katie? I finished a book. Well done. <laughs> yeah, I say that like it's a massive life achievement, but I have a five month old baby and a full time job. So what can I say? That is seriously impressive. It was a big moment for me. Um, the book that I decided to read and finish was Lost on Me by Veronica Raimo, or to give its original Italian title, it is Niente di Vero. And I'm sure that the Italians joining us will be like, ugh, where have you been? Because this book was a, a big hit in Italy. But it's only come out in English fairly recently. And it was exactly the book that I wanted to read as someone who is struggling to find time to read, in that it's a short and funny novel. Uh, it's about a young woman living in a quite eccentric, dysfunctional family in Rome. She later goes on to live in Berlin. And it's kind of semi-autobiographical. It's loosely based on Veronica Raimo's own life. But as you can guess from the title, none of this is true. You're never really sure what is true. She's a deeply unreliable narrator. And it really plays with this boundary between truth and fiction. Uh, But yeah, it made me laugh out loud more than a few times, which is what I need right now. And it's also surprisingly poignant at other moments. Uh, So I enjoyed it very, very much. It is called Lost on Me or Niente di Vero. And it is by Veronica Raimo. Sounds great. Autofiction is really having a moment right now. Is it? Yeah, like Edouard Louis. Ah, yeah, of course. And Chris Krause. I'd really like to read this. I'm going to order it. Add it to your collection. What have you been watching this week? 
Well, because of the sad and suspicious and premature death of Alexei Navalny, I thought I'd talk this week about the documentary about him that came mm-hmm. out in 2022 and actually won the Oscar back then for Best Documentary. I saw it a while ago, but I thought it was worth mentioning again. It's called Navalny and it seems to be available a lot at the moment. Lots of public broadcasters across Europe are putting it up on their streaming services again. So have a hunt. It's an amazing film film. It follows Alexei after an attempted assassination that took place in 2020 using the nerve agent Novichok. And the film is as much about him himself as it is about the work of investigative journalists at Bellingcat. I was completely blown away by it when I saw it. Uh, It's also just mind-blowing how brave Navalny was in deciding to go back to Russia after he recovered, aware of the risks involved. So I really recommend you go and watch this film if you haven't seen it yet. There's this clip from the film that's been going around social media, maybe you saw it. And it really struck me, this clip, because it's been quite hard to find any glimmer of hope in his death, like all of the headlines say things like Russia's last hope has died. Yeah. And so it feels kind of fitting to me that the only person with anything hopeful to say about it is Navalny himself. There's this clip from the film where he was asked, what's your message to the Russian people if you're killed? And he says, it's very obvious. My message to you if I die is you can't give up. You're not allowed to give up if they kill me. It's a sign of how strong we are. And the only thing that's necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Mm. So, yeah, a powerful message from beyond the grave. This week's happy ending comes from a team of researchers in the USA and Germany who have been studying the behaviours of young chimps, orangutans, bonobos and gorillas in San Diego Zoo and in Leipzig Zoo. And after analysing 75 hours of footage, they have concluded that juvenile great apes, so young great apes, enjoy teasing and annoying their elders. (laughs) They identified lots of different types of teasing, including body slamming, hair pulling, hitting and poking, tickling, stealing, and generally inserting themselves into another's personal space. Quite violent, some of this. Yeah, I mean, they are apes. (laughs) Fair enough. One of my favourite things about this study was that they noticed that, just like with us humans, if the teasing was ignored by the elder, it was, in most cases, followed up by more teasing, repetitive teasing, some extra pokes, or even an escalation of the teasing until they got a response. This is such great toddler strategy. It really is. Is, Was there any difference in behaviour between the American chimps and the German chimps? That, I don't know. (laughs) I don't think so. I'm interested in the cultural differences. The other question they couldn't answer was like, why do they tease each other? So we don't have a conclusion to like why in evolutionary terms teasing has developed. But it does seem to be clear that they definitely are enjoying it. Uh, And it makes me feel a bit better about my desire to tease people. It's not my fault I want to do it. It's just something I inherited from my primate ancestors 13 million years ago. Yes, blame your ape cousins. We're away next week, listeners, but we will be in your feeds nonetheless. It's coming up to two years since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and that anniversary has been on our minds a lot. So we wanted to replay you a story that we recorded this time two years ago, read by Alessia Kramechuk. That will be in your feeds this time next week. In the meantime, you can catch us on all those social medias that we're trying out. Twitter, at Europeans Pod. Instagram, at Europeans Podcast. Mastodon, what is it? Same one, Europeans Podcast. Threads at Europeans Podcast. Any others? I think that's it. I'm ghosting Blue Sky. There are only so many hours in the day. That's the limit on our slutty behavior. Have a good week, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye. Vislat. Vislat.